Um, I just want to sort of make one, one thematic point, which, which resonates with, I think, all the speakers that we've had in the morning session. Um, the, you know, so nominally this is called invariance, right? Or, or I mean, this session is called Beyond Feed, Feed Forward. Um, but also just to go back to the sort of basic uh, founding theme of this workshop, the, uh, the, the notion of hierarchies and invariance. I think invariance is exactly the thing we should be starting with if we're thinking about uh, what makes a good representation. But it, I would want to say it's sort of the tip of the iceberg, and the iceberg is causality. This is just a version of the um, kind of analysis by synthesis point, I would say, which is that you know what, when we're looking for invariances, whether it's like translation or scale invariance, or the more sophisticated kind of things that Stefano talked about, having to deal with you know certain kinds of geometry, occlusion, lighting, stuff that Russ was just talking about, or more interesting kind of objects and class specific kinds of variability, really what's going on, I think, is that we're, there's, there's a causal process, a complex co uh, composite of causal processes that form scenes in the world uh, that have to do with the physics of the world as well as you know, the social structure of things. And then there's the process of image formation from the scene. And effectively, our visual system, and, and, and so remarkably, so, so quickly, is inverting that causal process. And I think it's, that's, you know, we, we, need, we need to, if we're looking forward towards, I guess, the things that Russ and Jan were saying, don't get work at industry scale, we need to keep our eye on the more interesting versions of that. So I would say, you know, just, I'll just show a few demos, basically, um, not say so much about the actual work we've been doing, although we have a couple of NIPS papers that address simple versions of these problems. But let's say you're interested in, so for example, not just classification and detection, uh, in the pattern recognition setting, but when you have much more severe kinds of um, conditions with very, where, where the patterns are confounded with rich scene structure, or where we want to learn from single examples of novel classes, or, or where we don't just want to do classification or detection, but we want to be able to say generate new things, imagine what the world might be like. It's in that case when we need this kind of analysis by synthesis or learning and, and inverting the causal processes that generate scenes and images. We've been doing some work on this using a kind of probabilistic programming perspective where a program is a compositional representation of these causal processes. And I think it's an important uh, no, kind of representation because there's, if you, you know, if you, if, if you don't deal with the, the compositional nature of these causal processes head on, I think you're never going to be able to solve the problem. But just to put a few things up here, these are images which some of you have seen me show before. Like, if you want to detect people in these scenes, you really have to grapple with the 3D structure and occlusion in a really massive way. It's, 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 it, it's not just that two out of three of the typical parts of people are visible. You know, often, like, zero or one of the <laughs> hundreds of parts of people are visible in these scenes. Yet, somehow, you have no problem. If I said, you know, point to all the people in one of these scenes, you could do it. You even know that, you know, there's no people in these scenes, unless it's one of those, you know, philosophical philosophical plays like by um, Sartre's friend Beckett or something like that. Okay. <laughs> um, or here if I said, you know, detect all the books in the scene on the left or detect all the glasses, the wine glasses, beer glasses, water glasses, and so on in the scene on the right, you can do that. You know, if you, if you take this scene on the right here, for example, how many glasses do you think there are? Just shout out a number. Yeah, so 7 to 13, yeah, basically, I'm sure you thought of some number that was 7 or between 7 and 13. Did anybody not think of a number? No, pretty much that's the mean is about 10. Some people say 7, some people say 13, anywhere in between. How did you do that, right? How could you do that without reasoning about the 3D structure of the scene, something about the way light goes through these objects? Or here's a few things I just had fun last night at home. This is my kitchen. Um, so to bring it back home to things that are sort of like character recognition, but with interesting kinds of invariance of geometry and physics, I wrote a few words on some index cards, and let's see if we can, we can recognize them in an invariant way. So what does this word say? <laughs> yeah, give you a hint. It's one of my favorites. Um, so you can see, you can read it, even though it's occluded by, what is it occluded by? This kind of, yeah, it's a sort of plastic Tupperware glad thing. Um, and, uh, and you can also recognize, it, it, if you think about it, it's the same card. Um, and, and I think that the ability to, to read the letters here is, is not unrelated to the fact that you can also peel apart the surfaces that are involved. Um, or for example here, what does this one say? <laughs> one of my other favorite words. It's not smooth. It's not smooth. Well, okay, but you can still read it. <laughs> um, right, so again, your ability, I think, to recognize the letters and read this word uh, depends on being able to understand the surfaces in motion and to track the letters through this thing. And I think, you know, if, if we're really grappling with the problems we say we're grappling with, we should be able to solve these kinds of problems. Here's just a few others. Let's see, can we read these ones? What does the one on the left say? Yeah. One in the middle. 
convolutional, right. There's convolutional convolved with that glass. Um, how about this one here? Yeah, right, so again, you, to do this, you have to be able to do a decomposition into surfaces, you have to deal with occlusion, you have to deal with really interesting kind of inverse optics. Just two more, because I was having fun. The one on the left? Yeah, Did you, if you didn't see it, we'll do it again. Yeah, what is that exactly? It's like a, some kind of cheese grater. Okay, and one more. Yeah. Right. What? Deep learning underwater. Not deep enough. Yes, it's not deep enough. It's still pretty shallow. But, but you know, I mean, I, so I don't know, you know, what would, like, what, what, would, what would our systems do on this? But, you know, again, somehow I think our ability to recognize, I don't know why it's not playing. Yeah. Well, that's a hypothesis. We should, we should try that. Um, I'm happy to make my data available to anyone who wants to run in these images. <laughs> but I think somehow it's, it, somehow our, no, seriously, but our, our ability to read these things I think is not unrelated to our ability to understand something about the geometry and the physics of these scenes. So I won't tell you about this work that we've been doing other than just sort of advertise. This is work that Vakash Mansinga and Tejas Kulkarni, I think Tejas is here, right? That's Tejas over there, waves so everyone can see. Tejas is a grad student here. Vakash is a research scientist leading the probabilistic computing and programming group. Anyway, they've tried to tackle very simple versions of these problems, like looking at these kind of capture breaking things where they actually build a generative model of, of how text renders into an image and then put that in through a simple graphics engine and then do actually literally invert the, the graphics engine to try to take these captures over here and break them. This is just an example of doing that kind of ridiculous thing that Alan was saying, you know, just re a Markov chain over the space of scene interpretations. And actually, you know, in this case, if you, if you, if you handle enough of the variability and get the causal processes right, you can actually do a reasonable job of reading these characters under pretty severe kinds of uh, occlusion. Uh, they also can apply this to road scenes and things. I won't talk about that. And then finally, um, this, this topic of one-shot learning, we've all seen enough one-shot object learning demos. Here's my current favorite one. Does anyone know what, what this one is? Raise your hand if you know what this thing is. Okay, it's a two-foot, no, it's a, <laughs> it's called a friend, actually. Um, okay, so it's a piece of rock climbing equipment. Right now, can you recognize, are there any, any friends in this scene here? Point to where they are. Tell me where they are. Top. You're not even looking and you know. <laughs> That's great. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so you can see some over there on the top, even though they're upside down, they're actually slightly different versions of the objects. How about in this scene? Where are they here? Keep texting, yeah. Are they here anywhere? Okay, you get the idea. Um, so we've been studying this kind of, I mean, I, I think to really solve this sort of problem, you need to have solved the stuff I was talking about first, right? You need to have solved the, something about the inverse graphics problem to deal with the kind of variability here in, in geometry and occlusion. But since we haven't solved that yet, not at, at the right scale, we've been working on something kind of inspired by Jan's MNIST stuff, uh, a, 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 a data domain where we can study one-shot visual concept learning that's at least as interesting as handwritten digits. Um, it's, it, it's in some sense, you know, a thousand times more interesting because we have thousands of classes and not just ten classes. We've, been, we've built this data set of handwritten characters in 50 different alphabets where we have only a relatively small number of examples per class, but still in this, in this setting people can, here's just a bunch of these alphabets, um, people can do a kind of what people can do one shot learning here very well, and it's the kind of thing that our our machine learning systems that we have today should be able to do because it's not an intrinsically at the image level any harder or the scene level any harder than MNIST. So, for example, here are two characters in I don't know some alphabet, and um, let's see if you can recognize. Let's take the one on the right here. Um, so this this is one example of this character, and then here are 20 characters, one of which is the same as that one, written by somebody else. So I'll just move over these, and you just clap when I get to the other example of that character. Oh, that was good. Anyone like that one? No, okay. All right, so you were pretty good at that. Yeah, people are about 95% correct at this task, even when they're going through lots of them on Turk um, very quickly. 
Um, or here's an, here, just to show this sort of more, slightly more creative uh, generative model sort of thing, like Russ, you know, Russ showed those really cool examples of sampling from a generative model on real natural objects, and it's pretty cool that with three apples you can get some blurry apple-like things from a model that doesn't know anything about images, but still nobody would ever confuse those for real apples. Here we're actually testing whether our generative model that we've built for this handwritten character domain can confuse people at people levels. So this is an example from a little Turing test experiment we did where we asked nine people to draw another instance of one of these classes. So you, you get, you're sort of learning a class from one example and then you have to make a new instance of it. And then we compared that with nine instances drawn from our generative model. So let's see if you can tell the people from the machine. So in each of these cases, um, either the, the nine on the left or the right are drawn by the machine and the other ones are drawn by the people. So let's have you say, um, for this one up here, let's say in the upper left, would you, which would you say is the machine, left or right? How many people say left? Raise your hand. How many people say right? Okay, about 50-50. Uh, how about here? How many people say left machine? Right machine? Okay, there's a slight preference for right there. How many people here say left machine? Right machine? Right machine? Okay, again, 50, 50. So basically you can tell, we're sort of 50-50. Left machine? Right machine? Okay, slight preference for right there. Um, did anyone get them all right? You want to get, okay, well, um, <laughs> here's another one. Again, you just basically can't tell. Um, people are 50-50. Well, no, I mean, that's the point. It's a kind of a version of Turing test. So what's nice about this domain is it's not as complex as, um, or as really as, you know, as important as real natural images, but you can, we can, we, we're, we're already at the point where by basically building a model, I didn't really tell you how it works, but it's very similar to the kind of models that Alan and Song Chun have built. Um, it's, it basically has parts and subparts and it models spatial relations and then we do a kind of hierarchical Bayesian inference parsing in this model using a combination of bottom up and top down things. And, um, and, but the point is by, by putting together a bunch of the things we already know how to do, we can build a model that achieves human, I, I think human level performance in a, ch in a challenging and you know, actually valuable real world domain where there's a lot of dynamic range compared to something like MNIST where you know, people can do one shot learning but basically almost, you know, th th there, you know, we've, we've killed that domain. But here we're comparing our new character task with MNIST where people are still at 95% correct on just on that 20 way classification thing from one example. And then we take all these various models including ours but also this is joint work by the way with, with Russ and Brendan Lake I, sh I should have mentioned is the first author doing almost all of the stuff here. But Russ is helping us keep our deep learning comparison honest, among other things. But, so he's got various uh, deep bolts machines that have, that have been pre-trained, as our model is, pre-trained with 30 sort of separate alphabets to learn a good representation. Uh, but, um, and, and then can be sort of spatially enhanced to get it basic invariance to translation, scale, rotation, and so on. And that, you know, that can do pretty well. You can do, for example, 70% correct with a good, a well-trained deep learning model. But that's, there's a far cry between that and people's 95% correct. But this kind of compositional causal model with parts and subparts and spatial relations can basically get human level performance and even human plausible errors here. So I just want to put this out there. We, we, we hope to release this data set soon and encourage other people to, to work on it. Um, but it's, this is the, I think it'd be nice to work on tasks like this where we can get at versions of the, the hard problems that are not quite as hard as the full problem, but where we really take the challenge of learning a good representation uh, at human level performance seriously. So I'll just end on that note and turn it over now to our discussion for our uh, speakers. Thanks.